I think they're all. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. It's okay. Better. Uh, my name is Ann Bradley, and can't hear me. My name is Ann Bradley. I am the Vice President of Economic Initiatives for the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, and I'd like to invite you and or welcome you to our panel, Rand versus Jesus, which proves to be interesting. Um, so just a few logistical pieces first, and then I'll give a quick introduction, and then I, we're going to let it, let it go. Um, we are accepting questions via Twitter today, and so the hashtag is Rand v. Jesus for those questions. And no v. No v. Oh, Rand Jesus. Sorry, the hashtag is up there. I apologize. We just created that. And Elise Amix, who's, if you can raise your hand, she's going to help us moderate those questions at the end. Um, there's also, everybody's been given a survey um, through Students for Liberty. So if you can fill those out and hand them in on the table at the end when you're done, that would be great. Um, and so at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, we are. Uh, excited about thinking about how to make the world a better place, as are everyone here at Students for Liberty. And so our goal as Christians is to think about and bring about greater levels of flourishing. So that's what we think about. And that's why we would do this type of a panel. How do we bring about greater levels of flourishing? Well, we believe that comes through better stewardship. Stewardship to us is the integration, the full integration of faith, work, and economics. Faith, how the scripture applies to our lives and transforms our hearts. Work, what we were created to do in the world. And economics, which is navigating a world of scarcity. So when we can become better stewards, we can bring about greater levels of flourishing. This panel is an attempt to open a dialogue and conversation about how two different groups of people who both care about a freer society greater personal fulfillment and greater freedom overall can work together and learn from one another. And so without further ado, I want to introduce the panel. This is David Cotter, a theologian and economics professor at Indiana Wesleyan University. This is Will Thomas from the Atlas Society. And this is Mark Henderson, who is the author of The Soul of Atlas. So we're going to get started. Thank you. My name is Mark Henderson. I'm the, uh, the author of this book, The Soul of Atlas. The subtitle is Ayn Rand, Christianity, A Quest for Common Ground. And uh, I guess my entire life, for the last 30 years, uh, when I first became acquainted with Ayn Rand and Christianity, uh, has been an adventure. It's been uh, almost a tribute to my dysfunctions that I'm compelled to find common ground between these two disparate worldviews that, that most of us would agree are at their foundation opposed. And so I wanted as a, a, a sort of an introduction to our panel and our discussion to um, read a couple of short passages from The Soul of Atlas to give you an idea of the context uh, in which these two worldviews became very important to me and I think uh, you'll see why. The, um, the worldviews represented in our discussion today came to me through two men in my life who were very influential, uh, who really shaped my life. My stepfather, John, was a devout follower, is a devout follower of Ayn Rand and an atheist. My biological father, who I refer to as dad, uh, is a Christian. And um, when I was 11 years old, uh, my parents got divorced, and so that's really when I began to learn about Ayn Rand through John when I was living in his home. Despite the bulky emotional baggage I carried to contain my resentment, despite the bulky emotional baggage I carried to contain my resentment toward John, I listened to him. My rational mind couldn't deny that he made sense he did not admit it, but John taught me more about philosophy than any of my teachers through college and graduate school. To this day, I maintain that the kitchen table is a more powerful venue than any classroom. My sister and I used to sit at the dinner table and dread the inevitable continuation of, quote, the lecture series on whatever current events brought to mind. And it was here that Ayn Rand held court. While most families worshiped in church or synagogue, Mine worshiped in the pages of Atlas Shrugged. John preached eloquently about everything from the depths of altruism's evil 
to the zenith of reason and rationality. At 11, I wasn't exactly riveted. However, it wasn't his philosophy that fostered my resentment toward John. It was his very existence. As a child of divorce, I was, I was resentful toward my stepfather, and yet what he was saying to me and the philosophy he was espousing and really shaping my life with made a lot of sense. Every day, and I should, I should the, the context of me beginning to ask questions about these two worldviews uh, came as I was struggling with cancer as a teen. And, um, and there were a lot of questions that going through cancer the way I did brought up in my mind, my emotions, my, my will to go about life. <clears throat> This is a passage that talks about what I was dealing with uh, during that time. Every day stepped up the level of sickness, the intensity accumulating throughout the week and starting over again on Monday. By Friday, I was a mess. It was challenging to go to school, but it provided some distraction. The real work began after school as I headed to the hospital for my final treatment for the week. Taking the train from the suburbs, what I later understood to be the reverse commute, was usually uneventful. As I boarded the city bus, the few whiffs of, of dread approached. The bus stopped just two blocks from the hospital, and I learned exactly how to navigate the university hospital maze. Once I reached the waiting room and checked in, it wasn't usually a long wait. I was actually better off when the wait was long because I hated going into the treatment room. It was like being taken from purgatory into hell. My nostrils had been branded by the smell of flesh, being burned by the radiation and the pungency of bodies, refraining from lotions and deodorants for medical reasons. And here's how I really dealt with these two worldviews. My extroverted temperament has influenced the way I approach reconciling my two father figures and their worldviews. I process things out loud, and discussion gives me clarity. I don't know all the answers, but I think I'm looking in the right place. Something like a conversation has played out in my mind over the last 30 years, and it continues to become more nuanced with every book, essay, and discussion. And that's how I've approached this book. When I asked questions as a 16-year-old, I got 16-year-old answers. As an adult, answers that were satisfying to that teenager are no longer sufficient. The ensuing restlessness has led to me to Ayn Rand's writing over and over again for fresh perspective, digging deeper with each decade. I read a lot that provides, quote unquote, the other side or equal time among Christian apologists. But most of the apologies address the more prevalent postmodern morality that stems from the relativism, relativism of my college days at Brown. Through graduate school, it was hard to get Ayn Rand's ideas on the same page as the philosophers and intellectuals who hold the gospel so close. I've struggled personally, and the conversation of my life keeps returning to my relationships with these two men. While the conversation is challenging on an intellectual and emotional level, the spiritual dimension has been the trickiest. What do you mean, John objected? I'm spiritual. I'm more spiritual than any of those so-called religious fundamentalist nutcases out there. Jesus Christ. I never considered John to be quote-unquote spiritual because Ayn Rand looked at spirituality differently from others. John's spirituality didn't consist of something entirely separate from his material body, and he didn't think of his soul as something mystical or supernatural. The spirit of his moral principles ruled his own consciousness. Morality, reason, freedom, and rational self-interest these were the virtues that guided his life, and they should guide mine too, not because he said so, but because it's the nature of man to live by these truths. By the time I was in college, I started to digest my confusion and the discord of my life. My experiences accelerated adulthood, but there was hope. Exploring my father's worldviews became my way of reconciling my father's to the child in me that was left behind. While my intellect had accelerated to adulthood many years before, my emotions had yet to experience puberty. 
my intellect gave me a platform to engage with these two powerful life-shaping voices. The conversation that ensued launched me on a path toward emotional and spiritual reconciliation. Hi, I'm uh, Will Thomas from the Atlas Society. And the idea of the structure of this panel really is to try and find common ground here. And no doubt if you ask in your questions, we can bring up the many and their profound disagreements actually between the objectivist and Christian worldviews. But here we're searching for common ground. And so what I will uh, try to do in the few minutes I have is briefly introduce what Ayn Rand's worldview is and then focus on one of the areas of chief concern that people have about it and that's her ethics of rational self-interest, her ethics of the virtue of selfishness. <laughs> so Ayn Rand described her philosophy this way. She said, my philosophy in essence is the concept of man as a heroic being with his happiness as the moral purpose of his life with productive achievement as his noblest activity and reason as his only absolute. And that means following your logical knowledge wherever it leads and taking that as your absolute in your guidance of life. Now, in her ethics, Ayn Rand propounded an ethics based in rational self-interest. And this ethic in its essence has these elements. I mean, if you want to think of it synoptically, it has these elements. On the personal level, that is what has to do with you as the acting agent, you as the person who will live by this ethic, it means that your life is your ultimate value, that keeping yourself alive and flourishing in life is what matters most in the end. That happiness, the experience of happiness is precious and wonderful, but what it is is the emotional experience of success in living. And it's an ethic where you do not sacrifice your happiness and your life to anything. You don't sacrifice it. On the social level, that is how you deal with the rest of humanity, uh, everyone else, it has these core elements. There's much more to say, but there's, there's these core elements that you deal with other people by trade, and trade is voluntary exchange to mutual benefit. This isn't a ethic of killing people and stomping on them and enslaving them and murdering them, uh, because after all, who do you have to kill and enslave in order to live and be happy? No, you deal with people by trade, why? Because when you deal with them by trade, your interests and their interests go together. You never sacrifice other people. You don't sacrifice yourself and you don't sacrifice other people. And some of the key principles are to deal with other people by, with, by justice, to be honest in your dealings with other people, and to treat people benevolently, courteously, generously, and sensitively when you deal with them, to respect their needs as human beings when you deal with them. <coughs> but I want to emphasize something that's foundational here, and this is that the objectivist ethic is an egoist ethic and it's not an altruist ethic. Now, people hear the word altruism normally in talk today. They think it means something like doing something nice for somebody. But what it has traditionally meant in ethics is the doctrine that the <coughs> ultimate intended beneficiaries of one's actions should be others. And this is a foundational issue. And so objectivism holds that, no, your life and your happiness are what matter the ultimate beneficiary of one's actions ought to be oneself. And so when you think about ethics, it's in that context. And why is that? That's because each of us is an independent living organism. And each of our lives is a process of self-generated and self-sustaining action. If you don't eat, you die. If you don't get the right shelter, you die. If you don't find the other things you need to support your life and your existence and your health, you end up suffering and dying. And when, you're di when you die, you're dead. Life versus death is the fundamental alternative one faces uh, in, in existence. In this context then, health, physical health, and happiness, emotional happiness, are what characterize a flourishing life. 
a life that's doing very well at, uh, at living. But these are the grounds of this. Are you not an individual living being? Are you not someone who needs to take certain actions to live and to be happy? That's the core. But in this context, the way to deal with the other people is through the principle of trade. And trade is voluntary exchange to mutual benefit. Mutual benefit means you don't sacrifice other people. You don't sacrifice yourself. And it's voluntary. It's not coercive. Force is inimical to trade. But when you trade, see, you're offering other people a benefit. Well, let's say you go into a store and you want to buy a candy bar. You offer a dollar to the store owner. The store owner gives you the candy bar. This is a win-win situation. The store owner wanted the dollar more than the candy bar. You wanted the candy bar more than the dollar. Both of you all want to be there exchanging those things. It's to both of your interests. What objectivism argues is we ought to deal with everyone always in this general way so that when we're interacting with anyone, if we, if we are there by choice, we are there conferring benefit and receiving benefit. And this goes to friendship, it goes to love, it goes to family, it goes to everything. You should always be able to say, I want to be here, I'm benefiting, and you should always recognize that the people you're dealing with are benefiting from being with you. So that's the fundamental conception here of how to deal with other people. And I want to emphasize something about the word sacrifice uh, and uh, the way objectivism uses it. So objectivism says you should not sacrifice yourself or others. When we talk of sacrifice in this context, and a lot of people speak of sacrifice, they speak of it in a confused way because sometimes they're speaking about when you sacrifice something for something else, you're giving up something now to gain a benefit in the future. But this isn't really giving up anything in the end. In net, it's much more like an investment. If you give up something else, so you save money now, so you have savings later, are you sacrificing? No, you're not giving up value. You're gaining value by doing it. So the objectivist view of how you look at the long term, how you look at your long term relationships, is if they're worth being in, they're worth investing in. I have children. They are costly, a hassle at various times. They're a long-term investment for me in the benefits that I get from dealing with them, and I hope they're getting benefits from being with me. So the objectivist ethic, in its essence, is an ethic of achievement, where productive achievement is the central value in life, where the traits required for achievement are moral virtues that are incredibly important, where production comes before distribution and achievement comes before charity. And in that context, material production, because it involves your whole mind, your whole soul, is a spiritual activity. So that's the objectivist ethic of rational selfishness. Thank you. All right, and I'm David Cotter, and I teach economics at a Christian university. And I encourage Christians there that they should be reading Ayn Rand, because 30 million books don't get sold unless you capture some truth that resonates in the hearts of people. I also encourage objectivists and those who are just casual fans of Ayn Rand to read the Bible because I think you will find in there truths that are going to exceed your expectations and maybe even surprise you. And so today I want to talk about uh, in reverse order of what Will did, uh, areas where I would completely agree with him and areas where the Bible would say this is exactly on track, starting with material activity versus spiritual activity, sacrifice and investment, selfishness and self-interest, and then ultimately ending up with John Galt and Jesus Christ. So uh, first of all, material production is a spiritual activity. The Bible would completely agree with that. Okay, the very first chapter of the Bible, the creation mandate, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So that work takes on this activity beyond just what it takes to feed you. It's a spiritual activity. Also in Colossians, Paul says, whatever you do, work heartily as to the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. 
He says very clearly, you are working, you are serving the Lord Christ. And if you go to the If We table just across the hall, you'll see a long running video of people working and showing that work is fundamentally a spiritual activity. We would agree on that. Um, again, moving very rapidly because our time is short. Speaking of investment, this is a direct quote from what Will has on there, uh, giving up a value now for net benefit in the future. It creates value. Um, interestingly enough, I think Jesus Christ would agree exactly with that statement, okay? Uh, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday. He said, wait a minute, doesn't Jesus, isn't he the epitome of self-sacrifice? Well, in a sense, that's true, but the book of Hebrews tells us the mindset behind that. And very precisely, it says, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, okay? He thought he was getting something of value out of that in reconciling people to God, okay? Despising the shame and is seating at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, it's an investment in a greater good that he would receive. Um, or Paul or, Matthew, or Jesus speaking through uh, Matthew, whoever gives one of, the, of one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now this is Jesus Christ speaking, and you can see this is an appeal to the self-interest. Serve these people, and in fact, you'll find in this Matthew 10, he repeats this six times in different contexts saying, you will be rewarded for doing these things. Now granted, the Bible has a greater uh, range of motivation than just this, but at least this appeals to self-interest. And you might say, well, wait a minute, this is all future benefit. In the future, what about this life? Well, Paul, in many cases, but in this one specific, he's talking to children. He says, honor your father and mother. Uh, this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. He's saying it will go well with you in this life. This is for your good is why I'm asking you or commanding you to do this. Okay, so selfishness and self-interest. Let's just look at the different types of relationships relationships that you can have in life with God, with family, and with others. And if I were to represent Ayn Rand, I think I've done this accurately to say that while well, she puts God to the side is not existing. And so that inter, uh, relationships with other people and with family are a voluntary exchange for mutual benefit, okay? And that would be objectionable that the government typically says you need to, you have forced altruism based on personal needs. You have to treat everybody in, with altruistic. Well, I think the Bible would also agree with this in the disagreement with this, uh, or would agree with Ayn Rand in the dis disagreeing with this, that this is not the way it should be. Um, here's what I would represent as a biblical way. Um, in the marketplace, externally, you have voluntary trade for mutual benefit. The Bible is consistent with that but there are personal relationships in your family, me with my children, where it's not a trading relationship, okay? It's actually a, a, a relationship of sacrifice to these specific people, and the Bible would say that is a fundamentally good thing. So this is an area of contrast. So, and then finally, my last slide here, I just wanna bring to your attention the remarkable similarity between John Galt the man who by perfectly reason and objective standards is the epitome of manhood bears an uncanny resemblance to Jesus Christ. So let me just read to you. Both were born in insubstantial towns, embarked on a mission to right the world. Uh, they both attracted many followers but were revealed clearly only to a small group in a remote place. Uh, both <laughs> persuaded people individually with patience, passion, and perseverance. Uh, both articulated wisdom that resonated with a certain type of person prepared to hear it. Uh, both were rejected, treated as common criminals, and were complicit in their own torture, if you remember the Stoddard Persuader. And both were prepared to die and yet prepared a paradise for a select few who recognized and accepted them. Now we have a paper available on the If We website that details this in greater detail and more than just superficial uh, things that we could cover in this time. but. I think you will find that there's an uncanny resemblance. All right, now we're ready for questions and answers. Hey, 
if you all have any questions, just tweet them in and use the hashtag RanJesus. Um, I've received a couple, so I'll go ahead and start with uh, the first one. Is there any fear that by, try, by trying libertari tying libertarianism to Christianity that we may further alienate potential future libertarian supporters? Uh, do you want uh, me to start or? Whoever uh, wants to David? take it, it can. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, libertarianism is a broad tent, and we would like to encourage people uh, with whatever their beliefs to appreciate the value of liberty uh, for their lives. And so in that sense, we, uh, we would like to reach out to people of all faiths, I think, um, on the libertarian politics. We'd like to do that. Now, as an objectivist, I'm a critic of religion as such, and um, I'm I think that, uh, in fact, I'm a, critic, I'm a critic of taking a broad-based libertarianism as sufficient unto itself. So I think it requires a foundation and it requires the right foundation. But that said, um, the, the right foundation is that people are basically reasonable, that they are seeking happiness in life and appreciate it. I mean, for culture, that's what we need for a pro-liberty culture on an objectivist argument. It's not that everyone, you know, memorizes Ayn Rand and a uh, chance the right chance or anything. It's that they, in essentials, hold to the core ideas. That's the key thing. And I think that's very much possible um, even while we still have uh, religion uh, in our lives. I would say, too, that um, just to add to that or reinforce that you know, the, the whole idea of the conversation is to engage with our minds and every aspect of our being on all of these issues. And so, like Will, uh, I'm not ready to take wholesale uh, any body of doctrine, uh, but to evaluate it, to look at it, to talk about it, process it out loud. And I think that's, you know, groups like this are a great start. Okay, next question. Is it possible to be both an objectivist and a Christian? No. <laughs> no, I think uh, the, the basic answer here is that in objectivism, reason is an absolute. And that means the facts that you know through your senses, the facts that you know uh, through uh, reasoned uh, uh, thinking, those facts connect you with reality itself, which is the absolute environment in which we live. It's the thing that must be obeyed and understood. So the commitment to reason is, uh, as an absolute, is essential to objectivism, if one it truly is an objectivist. I mean, if, that's why it's called objectivism, the objectivity. Uh, and so, unfortunately, or unfortunately, I think um, there aren't, that all the uh, attempts to make a rational argument for uh, a deity or for a supernatural uh, existence it fail. So in that sense, no, I don't think one can be. I mean, objectivism is an atheistic philosophy, but it is one as a consequence of its commitment to reason. But I'd be very interested in hearing what Professor Cotter has to say as well. I would say yes and no, if I can nuance that. What, what uh, Will just said at the end is really the critical distinction. The context is, do you believe rationally, based on textual evidence, based on archaeological evidence, based on other evidence, that there is a God? Then I think you would follow logically into the path of becoming a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, if you knew there was no God, what surprises me is that the thought process is remarkably similar that leads you to this. So it's really, uh, the thought process is very similar. The question is, is there a God or is there not a God? That's a separate question for another panel. I, I would also say no, but probably for the same reasons that David just articulated. Um, I, I believe that atheism is fundamental or, or foundational to objectivism. Um, and you, know, you can't have God and no God in the same uh, belief system. So I don't think there's anything uh, such as uh, Christian objectivism or objectivist Christianity. Um, that said, I, I think that, you know, Ayn Rand didn't really talk about origins very much. Uh, she didn't really talk about the evidence for the resurrection. 
um, you know, had she looked at the evidence and, and walked through the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, she may have come to some different conclusions. And um, I'm not willing to concede that those conclusions wouldn't have been based on reason. Right, and it's worth emphasizing that reason is the issue here. So what Ayn, Ayn Rand objected to and what ob objectivists object to in religion is the appeal to faith, to the appeal to evidence other than the evidence of reason from evidence. And as long as we're in a conversation based on reason from evidence, then that's the right place for us to be. Uh, that's the uh, objectivist view. And then if there were, were there, I would say, were there evidence in favor of some of the uh, claims of religion, qua religion, uh, then were that their, their evidence and were that provable, then um, so be it. I mean, objectivism is not in that sense a, uh, atheistic. It's atheistic as a consequence. It's not atheistic as a founding principle. That's a key point. That's very helpful. And if I can just tag in, uh, Mark told you a little bit of his journey, but I started as an engineer and worked for Ford Motor Company. I was a plant controller. I left that in midlife and literally went and spent years studying Greek, Hebrew, traveling in Israel, traveling in Greece and Turkey, and examining the physical and textual data that we have following this path of reason. And so we, we disagree on the data, not on the process of reason. Okay, the next question is, do you think John Piper's Christian hedonism can contribute to this discussion? So this idea that self-sacrifice is in the long run um, in our self-interest because it would give us joy. Um, I, I'd say, you know, John Piper, John Piper influenced a lot of my thinking on this. He wrote a book um, in the late 80s called Desiring God, Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. And uh, in 1979, he wrote an essay called Ayn Rand, in appreciation and critique. So there were some things that he uh, agreed unequivocally with Ayn Rand on, uh, mostly having to do with her thought process, incredible architect of an internally consistent philosophy, uh, and she checked her premises and she went boom, boom, boom down the line, and he really appreciated that um, about her. I think um, when, when it comes to uh, self-sacrifice, I think um, his biggest contribution was saying that all throughout scripture there are evidences of uh, followers of God pursuing their own rational self-interest by putting God, seeking God first in their lives. Seeing God as the highest possible occupation of their soul, not themselves as the highest possible occupation of their soul, but with the end that they would lead that life of flourishing or that life of joy. If the Bible, if the God that's described in the Bible actually does exist, and I don't get to vote on that or choose that, I have to, as the universe, I have to take it as a given in the universe, then, then that would be the rational conclusion, is that, as the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Um, this next one is for Dr. Cotter. We're just getting a couple tweets on uh, clarification between the comparison between John Galt and Jesus. You can elaborate. Um, yeah, I would encourage you to read the Gospel of Matthew and then read Atlas. And I think you will find that, well, I mean that Ayn Rand both consciously, I understand, imported ideas of what a heroic man would be from Jesus Christ. And I think she also unconsciously did that as well. And so very specifically, uh, one of her favorite paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art was Salvador Dali's uh, Corpus Hypercubus. If you see that, it's an incredible depiction of the crucifixion scene, okay, in a, in a stylized way. And, and according to her biographer, she would look at that for hours because she thought that captured the essence of John Galt on the Stoddard Persuader. And that's when, at that point, is when I started looking at these similarities. So it doesn't surprise me that a truly heroic being would be like Jesus Christ. And it doesn't surprise me that that resonates with people in their hearts because it points them to a, a reality. If I can just uh, comment on that very briefly, I have a slightly different perspective. But um, the, in John Galt, Rand is trying to portray a perfect man. And in a sense, man as a god 
in a irreligious, a non-religious sense. So everything that a, a man can be that is, that is still a man, but is like a god, Galt is. And so then Rand uh, has notes in her journal where, you know, how you should treat him with a certain distance because he is this figure. And she imports this, this kind of Christian imagery of his, you know, uh, crucifixion, if you will, uh, in the book precisely to play this up and to sort of try and reappropriate the religious imagery and some of the inspiration uh, in the context of Atlas. Uh, but I don't think she would have said she was endorsing Jesus Christ. No, I don't oh, think she would either. Yeah. I think we're in agreement. The only question is whether Jesus Christ exists or not. Yeah. Okay, hey, uh, the next question um, is, does this mean that fides et ratio is, are irreconcilable? So referencing Pope John Paul II's second encyclical, Faith and Reason, is the point of our panel to say that you cannot reconcile faith and reason or that they should be reconciled? Go ahead. Okay, so far in our discussion, we were rejecting fides and endorsing ratio. So in that sense, we had rejected that. Um, now the objectivist point, the, uh, the point that Ayn Rand uh, hammered home with the idea of reason as an absolute is that if you accept anything other than reason as a standard of knowledge, you're sacrificing reason. You're sub subverting truth and you're disconnecting yourself from the absolute of reality. So that's the, that's the, the issue and this is the issue in religion uh, and the concern that objectivists have. So. I would just say I believe in Thomas Jefferson, though I met never met him. I think it's very probable he existed. Okay, I never met Julius Caesar, but from the data, textual and other art data, it's very probable he existed. I think Jesus Christ fits in that same category as the perfect man. I, you know, I think the we've been talking about rationality here. We've been talking about reason because I think that's where the two groups, the two worldviews can agree. Let's start there. Let's not appeal to the Bible as an authority because that's not recognized universally. But um, when I talk about my own experience, my own journey, um, I was confronted uh, in my teens and 20s with evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I was, I was looking into that. I was saying, well, how do you evaluate that? How do you how do you know whether Jesus rose from the dead or not? And so with that evidence, I took a reasoned approach and dug and dug and dug and asked questions and continued to pursue. My conclusion that Jesus did rise from the dead, in my understanding, validates everything that he said. And so I have, you know, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on that basis not on the basis of some arbitrary whim, as Ayn Rand would describe it, but I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, starting with my own experience and then taking that into the conversation because that's not something we can both build rapport on. And I'm not starting with faith because that, again, is not something we can build rapport on. But starting with reason seems to be a great place for me. Great. Okay, the next question is, how does an objectivist view charity? Who should care for an orphan in such a view? I guess I'll step into that one first. Okay, um, first, who should care for an orphan? Anyone who cares about that orphan. So there you go. Uh, anyone who cares, who wants to take on the responsibility of being a parent to that child, uh, go ahead. I, there's lots of reasons to be a parent. Lot, lots of reasons to be a parent of adopted children. So. Uh, that's it. If your measure of, of final moral authority is that all orphans will always be taken care of, well, and then you're a statist, and you will need to require statism for that. Now, what about charity? Now, uh, Ayn Rand argued that charity was not a major virtue, that engaging in charity, uh, you know, helping other people, charity in the sense not of love of God, but of, in, a, in that sense, but in the sense of uh, helping other people out, giving donations to, to people who won't give you any uh, proximate return that you can possibly imagine. But in that context, um, uh, the point here is that your production and your own values that you need 
come first. But charity in this sense is kind of like owning a Porsche. You know, there's nothing wrong with owning a Porsche and in the objectivist view there's nothing wrong with giving money to causes that you care about as long as it fits into the rest of your life and your values and you do it in a responsible way. But neither are we going to say you're a great hero for buying a Porsche and we're not going to say you're a great hero for giving money to the ballet you know, or to a hospital. Uh, no, a great hero uh, you know, uh, a great hero um, is a Hank Reardon figure who, or a Dagny Taggart figure who creates immense value in the world. That's, that's what's heroic in the objective view. Okay, great. Um, looks like we have time for just one more question. Uh, based on the common ground we share, what is the number one practical way you suggest we work together for liberty? I, I don't know if I can choose one, but I'll choose one and you guys go ahead and choose another. Um, uh, I think that, um, that capitalism is uh, something that Christians of different flavors uh, and colors can come together and agree on um, because uh, it, it both supports the, um, the individual as valuable uh, from the objective standpoint and it, it also does not usurp the role of the church in society. Um, those two, from the Christian perspective, um, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Right. I, I think we can come together talking about what makes for a good and flourishing life for people and what allows people to come together in voluntary communities like churches to engage in shared projects. And that's what liberty allows for us. So we have so much common ground there. Uh, it's, it's important. It's very important. Also, one more point for, for Christians, too. There is no morality without choice. There is no morality without choice. You force people to do things. They're not virtuous for doing them. If what matters is the state of your soul, then you must have the freedom to do wrong as well. So, and we have many common enemies. OK, that's helpful. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the ways we can work together, primarily, I would invite you, we'll still be here afterwards, and to the booth of the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. Much of the common ground flows through vocation, human working, flourishing, and, and the spirituality of that material production. So we'd love to continue that dialogue with you. And books for sale at the booth, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little capitalism right here for you. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you to our panelists. Very much appreciate it.